Hello everyone. My name is Peter Dree and I welcome you to the next episode of our Tax Byte podcast. Um, today I have in my recording studio with me Gilles Fransens. He's an expert in our team monitoring very closely the Pillar 1 developments. Stefan de Baats, senior counsel, former OECD and monitoring as well very closely these developments around Pillar 1. And since you cannot talk about Pillar 1 without saying something on Pillar 2, I invited also Jean-Philippe van West, senior counsel and close on the Pillar 2 developments. Now, why have I invited you all in my recording studio? Well, we have seen that the OECD has published a progress report on Pillar 1. After all the developments in the past months on Pillar 2, we would almost forget there is a Pillar 1. No, that's just a joke, of course. Um, but Nevertheless, good to recap and refresh our minds. So um, perhaps we will first have a little of an update uh, before we go in a deep dive uh, from you, Stefan. Can you just remind us what Pillar One is? Yeah, and then we will talk about who will be impacted and some first reflections maybe. Thank you, Peter, and good day to all of you. Um, what the OECD was actually publishing three documents. There is the progress report, but at the same time, they published frequently asked questions and effect sheets, including high level overviews with regard to the amount A rules on the pillar one and a process map for the next steps for applying the amount A rules. It's important to indicate that this is not a consensus document, except for the cover note. And this cover note is actually with regard to pillar one the first consensus document since the October 2021 release on the uh, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 document. So actually the progress report is a secretariat's note. We all know the origin of, uh, of this, this process. It starts with BEPS Action 1, the taxation of the digital economy, but we all know that ever since it's no longer about the digital economy. We will come back to that in just a minute when we talk about the scope. It's an overlay on transfer pricing, but it is not replacing transfer pricing. So the initial, the initial idea was addressing the automated digital services and client-facing businesses, but as indicated, that path, that path was abandoned when the Biden administration in the US came in. Currently, what is targeted are the large multinational enterprises. And when I say March, large, this means 20 billion of revenue, and 10% profitability. The 20 billion of revenue, when Pillar 1 is adopted or can be adopted, that can should be reduced to 10 billion after seven years. There are also some exclusions, some carve-outs, that is extractive industries and regulated financial services, they are excluded. Uh, there are also uh, elements with regard to, to segmentation at least you can have if, if in your ifrs reporting or your us gap or other general accepted accounting principles when you disclose certain segments but that segment reaches the 20 billion revenue uh, but and the 10 percent profitability then that segment would also be included although the multinational as a whole may perhaps not reach the 10 percent profitability So, to, so the progress report is based on the different building blocks that were open for discussion earlier this year. There were a couple of building blocks, for example, this, uh, on sourcing and nexus, tax-based determination, the general scope rules, the exclusion for extractive and uh, regulated financial services. Um, so open for public comments. There were two other Uh, documents open for public comments that was on tax certainty with, with regard to amount A and uh, related to amount A, but these are not addressed in this progress report because I think they are too recent. Further to the inclusive uh, framework in October 2021, so there it was already indicated that amount A would be implemented through a multilateral convention. So the inclusive framework building upon the agreement in 2021, in October 2022, so a year later, they will further this discussion based also on the public comments that they will receive. The inclusive framework anticipate a signing ceremony of the multilateral convention in the first half of 2023, 
with a possible entry into force in 2024 if a critical mass of countries and we can think for example about the united states we can think about switzerland we can think about ireland we can think about singapore which will be which in our opinion can be most contributing most surrendering states under amount a um, there's also the issue about entry into force if there is a, a critical mass of countries but the a related question is when will it enter into application or when will this convention will have effect and that will depend of course about on the signatory countries and when they will enter actually sign and it enter into application um, certainly in a startup phase this might lead to certain confusion for example differences in assessment years following a calendar year or a starting up period on april 1st or even on another date depending on the accounting period so confusion might be our share there the document itself is drafted as an overview of some operative provisions of amount a it indicates also some still open issues so it's not final yet for example de minimis profit thresholds application of other scoping conditions ongoing work on safe harbor rules um so all these elements are still open for uh, for discussion by the inclusive framework so it's certainly not a final uh, a final document it contains a proposed of consolidated version of substantive rules on a bound a but as indicated it is not final Okay, Stefan, thanks for walking us through uh, the, the, the documents that were published. But I, I didn't hear you say anything on digital service taxes. Does the progress report address these uh, so-called DSTs? Well, not as such, it does not address DSTs, but it mentions DSTs. So it contains a couple of statements with regard to DSTs. It confirms actually the withdrawal of all existing digital services taxes and similar measures with respect to all companies so not only the ones in scope of, of amount a but all companies and the multilateral convention apparently will contain a list of the existing measures it will also contain a commitment to countries not to enact digital services taxes based on market-based criteria when they are ring fenced to foreign and foreign owned businesses and when they are placed outside the income tax system. Now, the question is, of course, what if you don't sign the multilateral convention? Of course, you are free to install a DST. So DSTs as such are not off the table. It's when a country signs the multilateral convention that it should, should be up on the table. But the commitment does not include VAT, transaction taxes, withholding taxes under the tax treaties, or anti-abuse rules, so also there it is not fully off the table. Further work by the inclusive framework will be undertaken by on the definitional issues of DSTs, as well as on provisions for the elimination of amount A allocations for jurisdictions that may impose future measures within scope of this commitment. So okay. still room for DSTs, I would say. Okay, yeah, thanks, Stefan. And I, who says amount A uh, also thinks amount, uh, about amount B, and I guess for the for the audience, uh, a larger part of our audience is probably going to be impacted by amount B. Um, uh, amount B addressed, I think, uh, a fixed return for baseline marketing and distribution activities. So um, can you update us on that one as well, Stefan? Yes, I can certainly can give you an update, but it will be a very brief one because to date, nothing really new has been published. The cover note indicates that uh, good progress has been made and amount B should be level, should be delivered by year end. So okay. we are waiting in anticipation. So a year end present uh, coming to us. Okay. Indeed, okay. Indeed. Well, Gilles, let's let's may I perhaps ask you also a question. Eh? So let's let's shift the gears a little bit and let's look at the content of the progress report that was released. Can you can you enlighten a bit on on that uh, perhaps? Yeah. Sure, Peter. So, um, as Stefan already mentioned, the report itself has quite a few building blocks. Um, but in summary, what amount A boils down to is a redistribution of taxing rights. So that means that there's really two core parts of the rules. One part is how can a country receive additional taxing rights? And part two, or a second block, is how can a country then lose taxing rights? Um, and then 
maybe starting with that first part, so countries which would gain taxing rights under amount A, there's essentially two steps to consider. So a first step is the initial allocation of amount A taxing rights. And the way that mechanism would work is that the amount A and the way amount A is calculated, maybe also a brief recap on that, Essentially, um, the way amount A is calculated is you look at the profitability of the multinational on a consolidated basis. Um, and you look at, okay, how profitable is that multinational over and above 10%? And 25% um, of that excess profit uh, is, is deemed amount A, essentially. So that amount A um, is allocated to jurisdictions pro rata and revenue is here used as the allocation key for the, the pro rata split. And this is well important to note here is that this is regardless of the existing taxable nexus. So you don't need to have an existing legal entity or permanent establishment in the country. Um, revenue sourcing, so identifying which revenue can now actually be allocated to, to a particular jurisdiction is fairly complex as a topic um, with different rules for different industries. But at its core, what the, what the rules try to get at is try and trace the revenue uh, to the final point of sale. So looking towards the end consumer, regardless of where the, the initial sale by the multinational took place, for example, in a B2B context to uh, independent distributors. So if I summarize this step one, you have an amount A and that amount A is allocated pro rata um, over the revenue earned by the multinational group. Step two then um, is actually an override mechanism. So once we have our initial allocation of amount A, there's a potential override. And this is the so-called marketing and distribution safe harbor. What's a bit confusing here is it doesn't really have anything to do with marketing and distribution. Um, what it means is if a multinational has sufficient uh, taxable profit in a jurisdiction already, then the amount A may be reduced or, or canceled. Um, and sufficiently profitable here means uh, having a return on depreciation and payroll above 40%. So if your sort of profit before tax divided by depreciation and payroll, if that exceeds 40%, 40% could also be a higher, higher number depending on the, the exact facts. But if your profitability exceeds that threshold, if you will, then the amount A which is initially allocated to a jurisdiction is reduced by that excess amount. Um, at its core, Peter, that's that's the the sort of the first step. So how countries could earn, um, well, could have additional taxing rights under amount A. Uh, Jill, let me inter intervene here. That's interesting because knowing how Pillar 2 is already causing quite some, some issues to gather the, the data uh, for multinationals, um, how feasible is it for multinationals to also gain access to this final customer sales data? Um, do you think that's feasible at all, Jill? Well, I think these revenue sourcing rules, as they're called, um, where you know the company has to trace the revenue to the end consumer, is extremely challenging for, for many groups. So let me just give an example here. So imagine that you're a computer chip manufacturer and you sell these computer chips to a manufacturer of fridges, say. That fridge manufacturer then sells its product to a third party e-commerce platform, which ultimately could sell that fridge anywhere across Europe. Now, what that means is that you as a chip manufacturer, you have to ask the fridge manufacturer, so your customer, to ask the e-commerce platform, so their customer, to give you the data on where ultimately the fridge is being sold to an end consumer. There's, which, which of course causes quite, quite some complexity in the system. And from a legal perspective, it's, it's not that straightforward on, on how to get that data. Um, there is a three-year grace period which is provided for in the rules. So where 
during those initial three years of the rules being in place, simpler you know, mechanisms might apply. And there are some exceptions where even after this initial three-year grace period, uh, you could make use of allocation keys rather than this very complex tracing of revenue. Um, but it's it's definitely not straightforward um, to, to judge whether these exceptions can be applied in a given situation. Okay, right. Yeah, definitely something to monitor, I think, uh, when, when the implementation comes closer. Um, Gilles, we discussed about the additional taxation rights that some com countries would gain uh, under these rules. Uh, what about the other side of the coin, eh? the, the countries that lose taxation rights? Yeah, and th the way which countries would lose or give up taxing rights, which they have today, is through the so-called surrendering rules. Now, what these rules boil down to is that certain countries will have to give a credit or an exemption for the amount A, which is taxed in a different jurisdiction. So if a multinational has to pay an amount A tax um, in country X of 10, it means that uh, the multinational would need to gain a credit or an exemption of some sort in country Y, for example. Otherwise, there would be double taxation, which isn't the intention of Pillar 1. Now, to work out which country or which jurisdiction loses taxing right, um, the progress reports includes a fairly complex mathematical tiering system. And in summary, the way these rules would work is by looking at the profit before tax earned in a jurisdiction divided by payroll and depreciation cost. So similar to the people familiar with Pillar 2, for Pillar 1, we also often look at uh, things and calculations on a sort of um, jurisdiction basis. So at the end of the day, the countries which have a sufficiently high profitability based on this new ratio, so profit before tax divided by depreciation and payroll, those will be the countries which you know are sort of defined as having excess profit um, and will end up uh, losing taxing rights. And it's it's quite interesting and, and important to note here is this return on depreciation and payroll is of course pretty new. So it's not a common business metric on how to measure profitability. So this could give some strange results uh, when when you know you would apply this in practice. So for example Imagine that you would have a, a routine distributor, which I think for most people you would assume is not um, an entity with, with an excessive amount of residual profit. That routine distributor might you know, not be very profitable when its profitability is expressed as a percentage of uh, its revenue. But if you express its profitability as a percentage of its payroll, well, that distributor might be very profitable, um, and it could end up being one of the one of the jurisdictions which might lose taxing rights uh, due to this new ratio, which is in, introduced here to to calculate uh, profitability. Okay, thanks, Jill. Okay, that could lead to some uh, interesting uh, consequences, and and thanks for this uh, for this information. Now, Stefan, we have a progress report. The train is moving forward, so it looks like we're going to have a pillar one. That's a very good question, Peter. But the, I, I'm afraid the answer is not so straightforward. Uh, some say that pillar one is dead. Others say that pillar one is on life support, and if you hear people who are drafting at the OECD inclusive framework, the report, they say it's alive and kicking. So there is still some turmoil or other turmoil. For example, what will the United States do? Will they sign or not? What will other countries do? What they will, might look at the impact, for example, a surrendering state. Uh, so the impact of, of amount A on, 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 their, on their income. We know that at EU level, uh, the Commission is committed to adopting Pillar 1. We have seen the turmoil related with regard to Pillar 2, first of Poland, who refused to agree the, to the, or at least adhere to the consensus mm -hmm. with regard to Pillar 2. They budged, and now we have Hungary also referring to the 
pillar package, so the package of pillar one and pillar two combined, so all linking the two pillars. The EU has linked politically, not legally, but has politically linked uh, pillar one and pillar two. If there's no pillar one, the road is open for more digital services taxes with, we all know, different scopes, different rates, different provisions, different applications. So this becomes an extremely complex area. And of course, amount A, as Sashil has explained, is extremely complex. So it remains an open question well, whether we will have a, uh, a pillar one or pillar, uh, whether we will have a pillar one even today. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Stefan. Yeah, it uh, it stays okay. a little bit unclear. I guess if I would be in the audience, that my question would be, what should I do now? Should I take action? Jill, I think I want to ask you that question. What would you do if you were in the audience? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's an important one. Eh? So, I guess for for those companies who are you know falling in the scope as it is laid out right now so revenue above 20 billion um, and profitability thresholds above 10 percent but even those uh, with the revenue threshold above 10 billion which you know over time might also be impacted by these same rules um, I see in principle two things that companies can do so the first thing is you could model so do some financial modeling to see what the impact of this proposal would be the second thing you could do is provide comments on the paper individually as a as a company or as part of an a group of companies an industry builder, body what have you in practice however my gut feel is that the return on investment for both those initiatives might be fairly limited at this stage so if we take uh, the modeling for example so contrary to to pillar two um, the rules aren't final enough to do, to do detailed modeling and as Stefan outlined there's still quite a bit of uncertainty where i do see some analysis being useful though is to make sure that as a group you have even at a high level a view where the key impact might be and while most groups they they will have quite a good view of what are now their most profitable countries that picture that might look quite different when you look at it using that return on depreciation and payroll uh, ratio which might uh, turn out very different results so some doing some high level analysis there to figure that out that that might be useful just to know to know so that you know where you stand basically um, on the providing comments piece um, prior comments which were provided by businesses did have some effect um, if we look at the the revision in the texts um, but that impact was also not not significant um, that being said though um, providing comments on really fundamental topics such as the revenue sourcing which in its current state might make the rules almost impossible to implement for some groups those type of comments they might be worth repeating again and again really um, so that's for the companies which are directly affected by pillar one so either under the 20 or the 10 billion threshold for the other ones i think it is an area to keep monitoring given all of the stuff which stefan mentioned around the alternative of digital service taxes and potentially on the back of that trade wars etc towards the end of the year there will be again as stefan mentioned the the guidance on amount b which will be issued so i think there there might be a need for another discussion at that time because the impact there could be very broad for for all companies okay thanks Jill. i'm sure i will invite you back in my recording room here when uh, amount b is coming out um but okay thanks for that for sharing your insights in that um yeah the focus in this podcast and we're getting to the end uh, unfortunately was really on pillar one of course but i yeah jean philippe uh, you you have not been able to say a lot so i want to ask you uh, about the link between pillar one and pillar two and i think stefan already touched on a few aspects eh, on, on, on the approval process of pillar two but I'm sure you can give some more insights uh, to, to the audience. 
Yes, of course, Peter. And over the last, let's say, 10 days, uh, quite some uh, events happened. Eh? And let me start with, uh, with the European Union. And there, uh, Pillar 2 was not voted during the last e ECOFIN meeting of July uh, 12, uh, 12th. It was not even on the, Pillar 2 was not even on the formal uh, agenda. However, as you know, since uh, the 1st of July, uh, the Czech took over the presidency from, uh, from France. And actually, the Czech finance minister uh, said that he is uh, that he will be continue working over summer on on pillar two and reach try to convince uh, to try to convince Hungary, yeah, which still is the only country now uh, having a veto against uh, pillar two, try to convince um, Hungary and to reach uh, agreement on the next uh, formal uh, ECOFIN meeting. Have to uh, obtain the required unanimity, which is scheduled on uh, October fourth. Yeah, so they're working towards October 4th to reach this unanimity. Uh, if we see, look at other countries uh, in, in Europe, they see, of course, they, they've, there are quite some um, say voices that say that it's not possible that just one country can block uh, this unanimity, uh, Europe moving forward. And just to, to give you one idea uh, that there is, let's say, anyway, amongst politicians, broad support within the EU of Pillar 2 is that, uh, for example, today within Belgium, they're working on a personal income tax reform and our finance minister uh, van Pietergen published a blueprint and there is stated uh, they will introduce uh, a minimum tax uh, for mil multinational enterprises clearly showing that it's the intention of uh, at least our finance ministers to continue with uh, pillar two and that's what we hear in other uh, countries uh, within the eu from other eu member states so that's the European Union, uh, but well, the European Union is not of, alone, of course. Uh, let if we look at the US, there they're having some issues uh, with Pillar Two introduction of Pillar Two there, and there it's mainly with um, what's uh, reforming Guilty to align it more, uh, align Guilty more with the with the Pillar Two model rules and its uh, and the income inclusion rule. And there's uh, the senator uh, Manchin who expressed the last week Friday that he cannot support uh, the idea of po of imposing a minimum tax of 15%. So that of course uh, will make it more complicated uh, for the Biden administration uh, to reform uh, guilty. Not that it will prevent the introduction of Pillar Two in other uh, countries such as the EU, but as well Asia or our other countries. But that, of course, has important uh, an important impact or important consequences on the interaction between uh, between the OSD model rules and uh, and the US guilty rules. And then third, and uh, that's very recent, just uh, today, is actually that the UK uh, is moving a step ahead and uh, it published today uh, draft legislation seeking to implement uh, Pillar 2 into uh, domestic legislation. Um, although it's only a draft legislation, eh, so it has, it's not the adoption of, of Pillar 2 uh, rules in the UK yet, it still has to go to, to, to Parliament and needs the, the required majority's ratification. However, for me, if you look at uh, the EU, uh, the Czech presidency saying uh, they wa want to move forward, as well now the UK uh, publishing draft legislation, as well uh, uh, politicians, uh, ministers, uh, presidents from other countries saying they want to move forward with Pillar 2. For me, there's a clear indication that the question uh, is not uh, if Pillar 2 will be uh, introduced, but that rather the question is uh, when Pillar 2 will be introduced. And uh, my best bet is would be that it would be uh, most likely as from uh, 1st January 2024, but that uh, time will tell if this, uh, if this will as well be the time that really countries will implement, or at least a few countries will start will, with, uh, with that Pillar 2 will enter into effect within a few countries as from uh, 1st January 2024. So this uh, important, I think, for business is um, uh, don't uh, don't think uh, it, it stops now because there's a few obstacles, but uh, use the time wisely to, to prepare. Well, thank you, Jean-Philippe. And with those wise words, I would like to end this podcast. I thank you very much for uh, uh, sharing this uh, with the audience. So Gilles, uh, Jean-Philippe, Stéphane, Thanks a lot. Um, for the audience, I thank you for tuning in. If you're going on holidays, I wish you good holidays. If you are returning from holidays, well, then you had good holidays, I hope. If you listen to this during your holidays, enjoy your holidays. And with that, I end this podcast. Thank you very much. Speak to you later. Mm -hmm.